welcome everybody. We're here to talk about the emergency, um, the approaches to um, emergency department with the care of um, children with sickle cell disease. Um, we are just waiting on Anthea Greenway to join us. I'm sure she'll be here very shortly. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them in our Q&A um, within the Hover, Hover app. Um, and I think we'll get started because here she is. Um, welcome, Anthea. Um, great Thank to see you. you. We look forward to your presentation. Great. Am I able to share my screen? Uh, yep. You should have, great. yes. Great. Yep. I'll be one second just while I do that. On screen one. Just not able to share the right screen, unfortunately. Is that sharing now? Isabella, can I get you to just tell me if you can see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. I can right. hear, I can see it. I just mm. couldn't get my mute off. <laughs> no worries. Okay, thanks. So I'll get cracking. Yes, that'd be great. So thank you very much to the organising committee for the opportunity to talk to you all today about emergency department approach to care of uh, children with sickle cell anemia. My name is Anthea Greenway and I'm a haematologist both at the Children's Hospital and Monash Medical Centre and was very fortunate to spend a couple of years at Duke University Medical Centre in North Carolina learning and caring, learning about sickle cell and caring for children with sickle cell. I'm going to briefly discuss today uh, when do patients with sickle cell anemia need to attend ED, highlight some of the differences between children and adults, think about some of the common ED presentations, which um, piggybacks nicely from our presentation earlier this morning on pain, uh, briefly touch on how we avoid emergency department, which is always important, and uh, just have a slide at the end on COVID-19. So this audience will have seen this picture many times already today and in the past. And so we know that with vaso occlusion or blockage of blood, uh, blood cells with what I call sickle bananas. So I tell children sickle cell crisis is a bit like having a bunch of bananas shoved in a pipe. The blood can't get through and that blockage causes all of the cascade of effects we know affect sickle cell. And with regard to ED presentation, it's mostly the things on the left hand side of the screen that cause presentation to emergency. So vaso occlusion, infection, chest syndrome, stroke and preopism. Um, and these are the common reasons that children, particularly with sickle cell, present. Uh, for our adult patients, some of the more chronic issues do lead to emergency presentation. This slide is to remind me to just briefly mention that age does affect presentation, both with sickle complications, but also the things that take us to emergency. So we're most concerned about uh, pain and splenic sequestration and infection in young children with sickle cell. And then some of the uh, other issues such as stroke and chest crisis are more likely as patients are, um, become older. Just to remind everyone, in fact, the best way to keep our patients uh, out of the emergency department is to make sure we're paying attention to good management of sickle cell disease as a sort of global uh, concept, making sure we're paying a lot of attention to preventative health measures. As you've probably heard in the last day or over today and tomorrow, you'll know that for in Australia, really our only disease modifying medication is hydroxyurea but some of the other preventative health measures such as antibiotics and vaccinations, particularly COVID vaccine, are really important to keep patients well and as such, keep them out of the emergency department. But paying attention to all these aspects of care is really important. We have very good evidence-based guidelines, both from the NIH, so big US uh, uh, collaboration, but also um, the NHS and the um, English system and also the Canadian system. And many of these guidelines also move across emergency care for patients with sickle cell. So for that question, how often do patients with sickle cell need to present to emergency? 
fortunately, it's fairly rare in terms of uh, the frequency for the individual patient. Okay, so this is a big cohort study in uh, the US, four and a half thousand patients in California, published in 2017. And of that um, group, 88% uh, had one or more ED visit over the study period, which is over 10 years. But for most of those patients, they only net that the, the number of attendances in any 12 month period was less than one. And this is particularly the case for children. So you can see the top two boxes here, um, the under 20 age group, less than one attendance per year. That unfortunately increases to patients in their 20s and 30s and then falls off again. Uh, but, and the other point to note from this big study is that most patients, so up to 30 to 50% had less than three visits. Really the number of children needing multiple visits to the ED is very uncommon. That number does unfortunately go up for our adult patients. So very recent data um, from the West Indies looking at a similar question and this group uh, confirmed what we saw in the big US study. So I think the point of this study is to say this is not specific for uh, countries that are high resource versus low resource. So really lower numbers of presentations in children compared to adults. But what's also interesting and has some perspective related to Australia is that many of these visits were what we call treat and release. So the patient was seen in ED, but able to be sent home. And I suspect this anecdotally doesn't really follow the pattern that we see in Australia, where I think many patients presenting to ED would often end up being admitted. And that's something for us to think about as uh, the treatment, uh, as in terms of the treatment centres here in Australia. In terms of why patients came to hospital, it's the things that we, uh, why patients present to ED, it's the things we would expect. So vaso-occlusive crisis is the predominant cause, but then chest and viral infections, chest syndrome um, being sort of the top five really. Children uh, similarly, so you'll see from the bottom diagram, pain is common against, across all the ages but makes up probably less of a proportion in children because often infections, fevers and viruses um, make up the other sort of top five in our children. And then other issues such as priapism become more common as, as patients um, enter adulthood. Uh, and this last study was a very big study looking at 109, uh, medi over 109,000 medical interactions uh, for sickle cell patients across eight of the big US centres. And that confirmed the study that we just saw from the West Indies, where really it's pain, fever, limb pain and abdominal crisis plus chest crisis that cause patients to need care. So I think that's really important to think about what we can do to prevent those complications. Unfortunately, we don't have similar data in Australia. I think that's you know, something that we need to sort of address as a group of clinicians. But the, the one piece of data I, I, I do have is that looking at the rates of hospitalisation for patients in our own co cohort here in Melbourne. And I think the reason to look at this data is that th this is hospitalisations for a 10 year period uh, a number of years ago, but similarly, you can see that most of the patients that were admitted were admitted for the causes that, um, or for the reasons that ask pa that cause patients to present to ED. So, vasoocclusive crisis, infection, and chest syndrome again. I think the other thing that's interesting from this data is how long do patients spend in hospital once they get admitted from ED? And unfortunately, that's quite a few days commonly. So our average length of stay over that period of time was 3.2. I suspect this has reduced slightly, but it's still a significant, um, a significant number of days in hospital for these patients. So what can our patients and families do? I think one of the big um, things I would say to everyone is to think about calling ahead and think about getting in touch with your sickle cell team early in the crisis, in your crisis, so that we can, as much as we can, make sure that we're maximising uh, pain management and other modalities at home before you come to ED, making sure you've got the medical information that we need at the time in ED. So that might be a, an ED uh, letter or sickle cell card or whatever you have to help the team that see you on the day and so they know who to get in touch with. And I think the other really important message for today is to make sure um, that patients know when we want you to come. So if you're dealing with a sickle crisis at home for a few days, things are going well, there may be no need other than to touch base. But the things that we really need to know about is when the patient's getting sicker more quickly. So for many families, they may have a sickle cell plan. This is one from the Children's Hospital in Boston. 
but similar ones exist for most centres and it really helps us think about making sure we have fluids and pain relief on board and the pain relief will depend on the individual history of the patient and again marries nicely with our first session on pain this morning but knowing when to call and the things that I'm worried about which is high fever difficulty breathing or chest pain such as chest crisis dehydration worsening abdominal pain or obviously any sign of a stroke so it's really important that those things are in in the forefront of everyone's minds and similarly this is sort of a list that I give my patients with a plan to call the haematologist if these things are happening it's often really hard I think for patients and families to remember these when someone's in severe pain so having it written down I think is always helpful What's worked internationally is, um, is really simple things like this is a sickle cell card that's been used throughout the US and Canada. Patients might carry this in their wallet with some information that they then give to the first person that they meet in emergency to make sure that the um, sort of activation and the action plan is happening as quickly as possible. It has been shown to be found to be highly beneficial both by patients and families, but also by the emergency staff. Different centres do this in different ways. So this is actually a data card that they use in, uh, at one of the Oakland centres that has the patient's information plus all the sickle cell guidelines and they hand that over and that gives lots of information to the centre. The system in the US is obviously quite different to here. So patients may well be having to present to local hospitals that are not their treatment centre. So that's one of the variations in care. I would expect or we'll suspect that most of our patients in Australia would, would go straight to their treatment centre. So I, hope, uh, I would assume most of the sickle cell centres and many medical institutions will now be working with an electronic medical record. And so this is the sort of record of the alert system we want so that every person looking after our patient is aware that the patient has sickle cell. They know they need to speak to the haematologist and they have a list of sort of pointers to think about early in terms of making sure that we move um, quickly to the things that the patient needs to help them when they present to emergency. So in terms of our guidelines, this is the guideline from the NIH and really it makes the important point that right at the start when we're assessing a patient either in pain or in presenting to ED, before we go too far down the pathway towards treating a pain crisis, it's really important that we exclude some of those more complicated complications such as stroke or chest crisis. It's pretty easy because the person is in severe pain. We want to address their pain, but we want to make sure that we um, account for and make sure that there's not something more serious going on that also needs equal attention at the time. So pain is our most common presentation, as I mentioned, it can be throughout the limbs or the abdomen. Often we know patients won't feel able to move because the patient is severe. The area may be swollen or red at the time. Really, we need to get onto um, rapid analgesia and hydration, thinking about some of the um, non-pharmacological measures such as um, heat or a hot shower or a heat pack or things that the family and patient may use before and uh, a large number of guidelines that really, again, guide us in terms of how we get onto this pain quite quickly. So this is the Boston sickle cell guideline. Again, just making sure that we exclude fever with pain crisis. Often these go head to head and it's really important to address the fever and the sort of infection complications, but also making sure we get quickly onto pain is really important. I put this guideline up from the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, not to give you another guideline on top of a guideline, but more to um, just to remind me to say that for children, one of the biggest problems we have, but it's also a problem for adults, I must say, with sickle is the difficulty with IV access. For many of our patients in emergency, IV access is so challenging um, and you know, really can delay good treatment for the patient. So I think identifying that early, having that in the ED alert, advocating for our patients to say this patient has difficult access, you know, we need to get onto this quickly is really important. And one of the most important sort of tenants, I think, of emergency treatment is thinking about other methods of pain control. So oral or intranasal, so the, in, the in, or, um, or in, inhalational methods, just to try and at least get something started early is really important. The other thing about this guideline is it's put some, put some parameters in place that really help sickle cell centres to try and improve. So this guideline is about thinking about how quickly do patients get assessed, how quickly do they get their first dose of pain relief, and making sure that that is continually reassessed to ensure we're making progress. 
So this guideline you'll see on the side, you know, some sort of assessment and pain relief within 30 to 40 minutes of presenting, and then this continual reassessment to make sure the patient is making progress. And this allows sickle cell centres to really think about how well we're doing things and to provide a bit of a benchmark or a goalpost to improve things as we move through. So much of our evidence in terms of managing pain is, is now has now has good guidelines. And this is the American Society of Hematology guideline on it, both acute and chronic pain, which really sort of mirrors much of the information that we've heard today. Um, I think as we've heard, not being afraid of opioids, but taking a good history about whether patients have had exposure to very strong painkillers and what works well for the patient and family are really important and is just important in paediatrics as, as, as it is in adults. Um, and for many families, um, you know, most of our paediatric patients have, do, you know, do not have features of chronic pain uh, early on, which is fortunate. And so it is a different situation to managing adults who may have some chronic pain. The two things I just wanted to highlight from this second round of recommendations is making sure that we uh, ensure that the duration of the treatment of the analgesia is adequate. So one of the traps is sometimes for people to start to withdraw the medication before the pain crisis is quite finished. And I think that's really important. And also in this large international guideline, you know, they make specific note that non-medication non forms of pain relief are really important to consider and certainly may work really well. And that is certainly the case for many children. So my priority when I have a patient coming to ED is to make sure I've spoken to ED, they've got a plan, we've got, you know, doing our best to get the patient triaged with some pain relief on board, and that it's going to be reassessed so that we make sure we're making adjustments but managing ongoing pain. Uh, so this is some recent guidelines that have contributed to the conversation from our College of Anaesthetists and it makes that point that was also made this morning that uh, patients with sickle cell often have inherent differences in the way that they metabolise pain relief. And so really thinking about that is important. It's particularly important in that emergency setting becomes less important up on the ward when the patient's admitted. So this is the WHO pain ladder that our first speaker spoke about, and this is what we would use to really think about how we manage pain. The first step at the bottom phase one is really often something patients and families have paid attention to before the patient's getting to hospital. And so then we're really escalating to level two and level three. But as you can see, it's a stepwise approach, often using multimodal um, modalities. One of the differences in children is that often children can't really articulate or don't have the vocabulary to tell us about pain. So use of a pain score like the Wong Baker, which, is, um, uh, which has very good evidence for being very effective in terms of managing pain is really important. As I mentioned before, the non-pharmacological measures, so distraction, often with an iPad or a phone, we all know how distractible we are with phones and iPads but that also works in the setting of acute pain, but thinking about heat, hot shower, some exercise, massage and tens are important. In paediatrics, the other thing is to think about um, using our colleagues in child life therapy. So these are professionals who um, have an excellent perspective on um, age appropriate distraction techniques and can certainly help many of our patients who we know uh, the whole, the issue about being in hospital is a very often a very negative one is often associated with pain. There are a number of really fantastic apps such as the Oki app, which is an app we use in children to get them ready and prepare them for invasive medical imaging, for example, and these can be really helpful and should be used in the emergency setting. I realise it's complex often uh, and can be challenging after hours, but certainly is available. So just to very briefly mention a couple of the uh, conditions. So acute chest would be our other uh, very severe um, issue that we might see in emergency and really getting onto this quickly is important. And this is the reason that we ask patients with sickle to come if they do develop chest pain or worsening shortness of breath. Uh, and we know this is something we need to get onto quickly. The role of the emergency department with the haematologist is really to think about does this patient need to go to intensive care and trying to make that decision early, but also thinking about things like blood transfusion, which we know is um, really sort of the pillar of treating an acute chest crisis, um, either within the ED or very soon after. We know patients with sickle cell are at increased risk of infection because the spleen is not functional and it's particular um, bugs or organisms that cause this problem. And this is the reason we do all the additional 
uh, vaccinations and have patients on antibiotics. But the impact of this from the emergency department is if patient with sickle walks in with a fever, we need to get onto that really quickly because we know that the outcome is always far superior if we've given antibiotics early, should the patient have one of these invasive infections. Um, you'll see here the antibiotics do, uh, choice of antibiotics will depend, and that depends on the age of the patient, but also on some of the local, um, local mycobacterial organisms that we see. And so your local team will have knowledge of these, and this, this is the, the reason that we want you to come to hospital if your fever is more than 38.5. Splenic sequestration is a uh, paediatric specific condition, often rare in adults, but a really important one because of that risk of um, uh, what we call hypovolemic shock or low blood pressure and needs to be gotten onto quickly, uh, but also needs some careful management in consultation with your haematologist. And one of the things we teach our families to do is to feel the spleen as often the families can feel the spleen increasing over the couple of days before the patient develops a splenic sequestration. Just having that information is really helpful. One of our most feared ED presentations is the presentation with a stroke. And we know that unfortunately this can affect up to 10% of children with sickle cell overall. Um, and uh, similar to development of those other guidelines I've presented, this is the focus of a new guideline and much research in the field with a new guideline across both paediatrics and adults in 2020. Many of, much of this information I should say is relevant to ED. So a stroke is an acute emergency. And so for any patient with a severe headache or new neurological symptoms, it's really important we get them to hospital as quickly as possible. And you know, we're aiming to have the patient treated, uh, if, you know, assessed and if not starting treatment within two hours of presentation. That's a pretty tight timeline. I think that's why it's really important for uh, practitioners, but also patients and families to know what we're looking for. One of the important things from this guideline is you know, to recognise that there's multiple team members involved in this diagnosis. It can take a bit of time, but if this is a concern from yourself or your family, or as the practitioner, if you're concerned about a stroke, getting onto treatment very quickly is really important in terms of improving the outcome. This is one of the other specifics I wanted to mention about children. So one of the problems is often with a stroke, we were wanting to confirm um, the examination findings with a, a, a neurological in, um, investigation or radiological investigation, such as a CT or an MRI. But for our small patients, this may involve an anesthetic. So for many, many patients, we're needing to get on and get them treated or at least start their treatment before we may have confirmation, but always better to have not needed the treatment you started, I think, in this setting. So my last um, couple, avascular necrosis is sickling in our, in our hip or our shoulder. This can precipitate an acute presentation with severe pain with limp. And it's a really important, again, to get seen during this so that we can do as much as we can to prevent some of that long-term damage. And our last one, pre-epism, um, which is more common in adults, but I think it's important to make sure we're teaching patients and families and also our emergency and ED staff that this is a, an emergency and making sure that patients present very early during an episode of pre-epism so that we can as much as possible limit long-term damage, get on to treatment and, and have the team, including the urologists involved so that we can treat this quickly is really important. Some new medical treatments, um, so vasodilators and other medications that may well be helpful. So important to present early rather than staying home if this is happening. Um, so I think the things that I just wanted to really highlight is, you know, making sure that we contact our sickle cell, we contact that the sickle cell treatment centre is in the loop if someone is unwell at home. Thinking about the transfusion medicine history, if you are travelling, making sure you've got a letter from your sickle cell centre. And I think importantly, knowing where to go to get help is always helpful. In the world where we can imagine being on holidays, you can imagine finding out where you're going and where you need to go at the other end. I think that's really important in terms of managing a long-term illness such as sickle. Um, I just wanted to briefly, I know there's a number of sessions on COVID in the, in, um, in the conference, but um, this is a, a, a guideline developed by the American Society of Hematology to help us really in this era of COVID to think about patients um, and what we might need to do in the emergency setting. Um, so relevant for our practitioners. And I think the role of the haematologist is to make sure that we're making this 
information available to our emergency practitioners who are needing to look after our patients in this setting. Uh, and just to finish off, um, you know, th there has been a big focus in the last five to 10 years in terms of improving outcomes for emergency. And this comes from feedback often from adult sickle cell patients that their experience in emergency is not fantastic on every occasion. I think that's really important to take that feedback and do what we can to improve things. And so um, this uh, publication by Jeffrey in 2017 really looked at what can we do practically on the ground to improve things. And that involves some of the information I've given you, but also thinking about knowledge for providers, so videos, websites, um, but thinking about some of those quality projects like time to be seen and uh, time it takes to be seen and assessed and time it takes to get analgesia on board. Uh, and so some of the, I think some of these practical um, targets are really important for us to look at as a community to make that experience as positive as we can. So this is one of the websites that's available and may be really helpful for practitioners who are not dealing with sickle cell every day, for example. So this is my last slide and I just... <laughs> I wonder if you can tell from the colour of my hair or from the social distancing, which of those photos is the most recent. <laughs> but this is a number of the um, people that I'd like to acknowledge that I work with uh, in terms of uh, both my professional life, but working with patients with sickle cell. Uh, and it was a pleasure to talk to you today and I might stop there. Thank you, Anthea, for that really insightful information about um, a care of sickle cell patients within Australia and showing us the differences from other countries from around the world and what they do. It's always good to know that we're actually right on par with all of them. I've got a couple of questions and I'm mindful of the time because I know another session um, is starting. Uh, I just thought that uh, if you if you would or if you wouldn't mind, I'm um, just answering a couple of them. So one of the questions was um, what emergency drugs can be given during a crisis? At the moment in Australia, we use fluid and hydration. We don't have access to a couple of the medications that the audience may be alluding to that may be used um, in a crisis. So really it's um, pain relief and fluids and we rarely use transfusion now in acute painful crisis. The evidence is that we're actually better to hold off on transfusing in that setting unless there's associated um, significant anemia. And so the medication and the pain relief choice will depend a bit on the history from the patient in terms of what they've had before and what, what has worked well. Yeah. Okay, th thank you. And one more question. Um, one of the questions was why are some of the emergency department staff are a bit slow in taking patients into the department um, to begin treatment? Yeah. What do you think that might be? Yeah. Look, I think it's, a, you know, hospitals are complex places. There's often a lot going on. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, it's, all, it's an individual situation. I think that contacting your sickle provider allows them to advocate for you and just, you know, sometimes it is possibly lack of knowledge. So a sickle is, you know, not a rare condition, but less common than some of the presentations that um, the emergency staff will be used to seeing. So just a short amount of education can often facilitate the fact that we really need the patient to move through quite quickly. There's also sometimes infection control and other issues that might mean that they're juggling things to get the patient into appropriate area of ED. So I think it's often a com complex scenario, but that's why talking to your sickle cell provider and having them sort of advocate for you to get things going quickly is is often real, I find really helpful. Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Anthea. Um, like I said, we're mindful about time and we're about to start the next session. Um, thank you for all your information. Really appreciate that on our very first um, Australian Sickle Cell Conference. <laughs>